Okay, great. Okay, guys. So here we have the next panel, um, and uh, the moderator is here. Uh, the panel regarding uh, NFT games market in 2020. So please introduce your guests. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Yashar Sarıldız, co-founder of MBCS, which is a digital focused communication agency. So with the acceleration of digital world, the words NFT and metaverse began to appear in our every sentence. Today, we will talk about NFT games market. Uh, our three amazing speakers are here and one will join. Let's get to know them together. Let's start with you, John. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Jordan. Um, I've been in the blockchain game space uh, since early uh, 2018, when I guess a lot of people sort of got involved with uh, when CryptoKitties was really the first sort of NFT project. Well, not really a game, um, had game elements, but that was a sort of a, a project that's got a lot of people interested in, in what was going on um, and been following the space sort of very closely since then. So I, um, as, as, as I guess a few people in the blockchain game space, I don't really have any any sort of fixed thing that I do. I consult for a few uh, blockchain games companies. I consult with a few investors. Um, I do a whole bunch of my own research. Uh, I've got a, like a Substack and a YouTube channel and a podcast and all that sort of stuff. But uh, basically, I just spend a lot of time um, focusing on games and, and blockchain games. I've been in the games industry more generally for 20 years now. Um, so I've sort of seen a lot of, of changes there. I just think per, on a personal level, I think the addition of, of sort of blockchains and NFTs into into games is a, is it in some ways a very natural step because we've all played games and we've all owned digital assets um, in games, and but adding this ability for people to sort of own them and be able to trade them um, it, it is a really big uh, sort of change to what's going on. So it's there's always this argument, I guess, about whether blockchain games are like an evolution or a revolution. Uh, maybe maybe it's, it's a bit of both. But yeah, that's my background and uh, my Twitter is in the in. in uh, in the, the name there so blockchain gaming if you want to follow what i'm doing but uh, glad to be here so they can follow you on twitter <laughs> yeah <laughs> and let's continue with you robert could you please tell us about yourself and reality gaming group sure so um i'm the head of marketing at um reality gaming group who i will refer to as rgg for the rest of this to save us some time um we are a well we wrote quite an interesting business actually because we have a legacy in games um not a new web free business so we came from mobile uh and a lot of us have been working in the industry traditional games industry for years and years i've got about 10 years experience working at places like curve and electronic arts um and i sort of we sort of almost fell into nfts ourselves but much earlier than a lot of people did uh we had a game called reality clash which was a mobile AR game that happened to use NFTs uh, to uh, sell the weapons in the game. And this was on the App Store way before uh, it was uh, sort of regulated by the Apple terms and services, right? So we were really early out of the gate with that. And then, I mean, because of that, we were in a sort of right time, right place moment with with the market as Crypto Kitties, as John mentioned, sort of happened. Um, people started looking at this more. Ethereum really sort of started moving as a network that was usable for people to build platforms and build games on. Uh, and we got a partnership with uh, an organization called the BBC, um, very well known in England, I think quite well known around the world, uh, but they are sort of our state uh, run media organization. Uh, and um, well, not state run, but taxpayer funded, I should say. Uh, we got a deal to make a Doctor Who NFT game uh, called Doctor Who Worlds Apart. So we that's our main big gaming project. Um, we call it a, a digital trading card game set in the Hooniverse, uh, sorry for that, um, where you own the cards, right? And that's, that's our pitch and that's where we use blockchain. So all of our cards, except the ones you start with, are all NFTs. You can sell them, you can take them to uh, our marketplace uh, or you can take them to OpenSea and other nft marketplaces uh, on the internet with polygon with binance with ethereum and you know you have that sort of digital ownership that john sort of touched on you know that, and that's really really important for us as a point of the tech to have some actual utility and actual use behind it and for us it's yeah it's like saying okay pokemon cards have um 
have that. You can sell Pokemon cards, you can sell Yu-Gi-Oh cards, uh, but you couldn't sell digital cards from other games, but now you can. So that's where we, we've integrated the tech in. And we also now have shifted ourselves into a web-free sort of, we call ourselves like a, a full service business for web free. So we, we do with lots of brands, big multinationals um, uh, and, and celebrities that come to us and say, ah, oh, NFTs are a thing. How do we do those? So we have some experience working with different brands on different verticals um, and, and getting them set up into this space. Okay, great. I will have lots of questions to you. <laughs> so, Eugene Shekula from DeepMind Mart. Could you also please introduce yourself and tell about DeepMind? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Eugene and I'm the head of operations in DeepMind, which is an uh, NFT sci-fi metaverse game, even though like metaverse is a very high port now. Uh, but I mean, like, the pinnacle of our game is the open market economy. It's like the main point. So the thing is that we can integrate a lot of projects in, in, into DeepMind, uh, which will work together in, a, in an open market way. As you can see, I'm already on the planet of Eleazar. This is where the, 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 the story takes place. Uh, and like actually, the alpha of our game will be released this summer. So it's, it's, it's pretty close. And we already have uh, on-chain activities for the holders of our NFTs. So yeah, I mean, like the market is... The topic of this of this speech is the market, and the market is harsh. But I think you know, keep, everyone just needs to keep pushing, you know, and that's what we do. Thank you. So, welcome again, Adam. You are very popular today. <laughs> let's let's talk about yourself and Epsfly. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, I'm Adam Smart. I'm the director of product for gaming at Epsfly. Um, I've been in gaming for around, mostly mobile gaming for around 13 years, uh, mostly on the product side, so, so staying away from the marketing element. Um, I've now made the move to, to an MMP, to AppSlayer, um, and I'm really utilizing my, my gaming experience, gaming knowledge, to look at how we can extend AppSlayer's gaming offering through as much product innovation as possible. Um, I'm also super lucky to host a, a podcast um, in the sandbox with where I get to dig into all sorts of gaming topics um, that quite frankly I'm interested in. Um, I see I see myself as a as a web3 and crypto gaming enthusiast um, and I, I was very excited about Robert's Doctor Who game <laughs> a little while ago and uh, yeah really excited for the conversation. Okay, then let's start with John. My first question is for you. Uh, in playing to earn games, gamers are happy with the earnings as the number is currently at reasonable levels. Another goal of game companies is to increase the number of gamers. Sure. So in this case, there's a dilemma. Uh, a dilemma arises because the costs are increasing for gaming companies. At this point, what is your suggestion to game companies and also investors? Mm. And is this the most challenging problem is the in, the, in the industry or what is it? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I would I would sort of take a step back. I, I So I've never personally liked the term sort of play to earn very much uh, sort of came in, I suppose, uh, about a year ago with the rise of Axie Infinity. So um, I think now generally what you find is because because of what's happened with Axie Infinity, um, most most companies now are sort of no longer using the term sort of play to earn. So generally they either avoid it entirely or they use sort of a modified term. Play and earn is, is sort of, I guess, something we're seeing a lot of. And, and what pe I think what people now are trying to do is clearly, um, you know, focus and their, their marketing and their audience on the fact that you're going to play a game and you might earn something, but like you're not playing and the only thing you're doing is earning, which was clearly um, for a couple of months, that's what happened with Axie Infinity. And I, and I kind of think, you know, we're a very early industry. Um, so it's not surprising that we see these um, sort of uh, big sort of growth curves, but not necessarily very sustainable ones. So basically, because I spent a lot of time looking at Axie Infinity, um, you know, love the team, uh, you've followed them for, you know, I've known them for a long time. Um, there's just, just, just this sort of weird thing happened sort of June, July, August last year, where the underlying um, asset, the, the SLP token, you know, went up an enormous amount for no sort of particular reason. There was just general sort of speculative uh, movements around that. And for a month, you know, I guess we all saw the headlines. People in the Philippines could earn like, you know, 
a, you know, a, a high sort of salary um, just by playing this game. And it was partly the way the game was set up. You could just turn up and basically you got a whole bunch of these tokens really for not doing very much. You didn't have to be very skilled. Um, and the price of these tokens went up for, for reasons nothing to do with what the Axie team was doing. Um, and then you got this massive feedback loop that obviously people in the Philippines were earning, you know, hundreds of dollars maybe a month. Uh, and they were telling their friends and then that sort of spread globally. And you had all these guilds setting up and the guilds owned the NFTs. And they were lending them out to people. And, and basically you got this massive explosion. Axie went from basically no users to I think it, was, it peaked about 2.7 million uh, users a day. It's now down to under a million. Um, and, and we sort of... we. It, I guess it's a little bit sort of cup half full or half empty, glass half full or half empty. So to me, like the growth of Axie Infinity was a great example of, you know, there is a lot of demand for this, for these sort of blockchain games. This is what we sort of, one of the things we'd expect to see in blockchain games. It's a new way to play. People can can earn real world value. That's very kind of useful. Um, but but the product, you know, wasn't correct. Uh, it wasn't sort of set up for this enormous number of people coming in. And we've seen with Axie Infinity since then, they've done a lot of changes to the features. So you can't just sort of, open the game every day and earn a lot of these SLP tokens. You have to actually be skillful at the game. It's now most of the prizes are sort of funneled through leaderboards, a bit more like an eSports sort of setup. The price of the SLP token clearly has sort of collapsed, probably down 90, what it is, 95%. So that's taken a lot of audience away from that. Um, and I think in the long term, that's good because those games were never sustainable. If, if, if all you have is a, a large audience of people playing a game and whatever token they're going to get, they're immediately going to sell it onto an exchange. Then, you know, that only works if there's some reason that other people will come in and buy that token and do something with it. Um, so I think, you know, one outcome from this is everyone making a blockchain game is thinking much more seriously about, you know, how, how can you build an economy? So, you know, typically in game economies, you have things called kind of, um, you know, sinks, which basically means over time, people tend to get a lot of, um, sort of currency even in non-blockchain games in world of warcraft you end up with loads of gold the more you play the game and gold becomes sort of um you know less valuable because you have a lot of it so you, then you need something to do with large amounts of gold so you need big things to buy or, or or reasons to sort of spend it so blockchain game designers are getting much cleverer at how they can sort of build out these these big economies and you know and no one's really ever done this at this sort of scale maybe a few games like eve online have sort of done it in the traditional world but no one's done it um with a with a blockchain game that may be used by millions of players every day, um, may have you know an economy of you know worth billions. Um, and these things are incredibly difficult to, to balance. We're seeing some better tools coming out. So there's a um, a, a company I, I sort of work with called uh, Machinations out of um, Luxembourg, and they have this sort of game development um, kind of uh, economy tool that you can sort of it's a visual tool you can sort of create an economy and you can see sort of things tokens moving around and you can change the price and see what happens. So so I'm quite sort of positive that. In the long term, we'll we'll find game developers who are very smart will find ways of building economies that that are more sustainable, uh, more sustainable. Um, but I think we have to think a bit more broadly about sort of play, play to earn, play and earn. I think the other thing I I, I think um, what will happen is in certain sort of geographies, you know, if you're in a very low wage geography where you're earning like five dollars a day, the ability to use your mobile phone and earn an extra dollar a day is, is a massive thing. So I think there will be games that sort of play more to that audience. Um, obviously, you know, in, in in other economies, earning an extra dollar a day is sort of meaningless to most people. So those sort of games won't appeal. And and maybe we'll see a bit more of a, you know, a hybrid approach. So people talk maybe a bit about sort of Web 2.5 games, which are sort of traditional games with a little bit of sort of blockchain in there, maybe more around NFTs rather than, than sort of uh, than, than, than fungible tokens. Um, and, and those games will sort of expect people to, Maybe they'll be paying play, playing for free. Maybe they'll buy NFTs, but maybe they'll also spend, um, you know, buy their credit card to, to do things in the game like we would normally do in a free-to-play mobile game. So I think we're going to see a sort of a mashup of these different sort of uh, monetization options, and that will sort of play out in different ways depending on the, the type of product. Is it a casual mobile game? Is it a hardcore PC game? Is it an MMO? You know, um, but we'll, we'll see different companies finding a sort, a sort of sweet spot, and they'll attract different audiences um, for that reason. Thank you very much. I really enlightened. <laughs> so second question is for you, Adam. Uh, 
I want to ask some questions about marketing according to your AppSwire experience. So what is the difference between NFT gaming marketing and normal gaming marketing? You know, social media ads also give detailed information and analysis. How do you differ from social media statistics such as analysis and insight? And according to your experience, is there a difference between non-gaming target audience and gaming target audience? And last question, one, one more. So uh, how does the refinement of privacy affect DPAs, dynamic product acts? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of different questions there. So I'm going to, I'll start from the very beginning. So uh, the way the way we're seeing it, uh, currently at NFT games, uh, very much early stage uh, in, in the entire evolution. Um, they're predominantly pay to earn titles, which is great. I mean, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It resonates with the 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 type of audience, but it's a different type of audience at the moment to the the more established mobile gaming community. You know, that 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 would generally play consoles and mobile games. Um, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a you have to remember that it's a different type of audience when you're going through the advertising process. Um, the, I guess, um, for, for me, I guess one of the, the more interesting games, apart from the Doctor Who title, that's come out more recently uh, is the, the drop from Jam City, um, Champions Extension, which I, I think it really starts to build on the, the larger sort of gaming title. I mean, obviously, there is no game at the moment, and it's, it's all about the, the NFT drop. Um, but the the potential there to be able to use those characters in the game, uh, you know, once you've once you've purchased them, it really opens up the the sort of from a marketing perspective, it brings in the 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 buzz. Uh, you know, being able to buy these champions before the game comes out, it really produces that that drive and that buzz. It was in all of the media outlets, and I think that's one of the biggest areas for uh, NFT at the moment, certainly NFT gaming, is to be able to create that very substantial buzz. It's ultimately with 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 NFT games, the value is in the value of the the NFT at the moment. You know, if it's a play to earn game, the NFT has to hold that value. Um, and being able to create that drive, being able to create that demand for different uh, NFTs within the game really drives the, the, the um, people playing that game to try and achieve those NFTs. Um, in, terms of, in terms of marketing, I guess uh, NFTs and, and sort of more traditional mobile um, focusing they're very different focus at the moment because because of the lot of the issues surrounding nft on on uh, or nft gaming on mobile and crypto gaming on mobile um companies are really starting to focus on web instead of mobile offerings um because you know google and apple really haven't taken a a, a solid stance on this as yet um, and there's a lot of uh, th there's potentially a lot of problems with with being pulled from the store and that sort of stuff. So a lot of the companies are focusing very much on on web based, and that produces different issues with advertising and visibility of advertising. You know, it takes takes it a large step away from the traditional mobile advertising, and brings it way more to even more traditional web-based advertising um but obviously a lot of the the crypto games are running on on web browsers which are you know the brave for instance which is fantastic and it cuts all all forms of tracking so all forms of cookies and that sort of stuff that makes it very very hard to run the types of advertising that we're used to um, so a lot of a lot of crypto companies are, are working predominantly with communities, really trying to to, to encourage community play. Um, and again, I'm sure with the the Doctor Who title, that's a the community aspect to that is probably a a, a very large factor in the, in the marketing. No, okay. <laughs> it, it, it's a huge thing. Yeah, I think you've touched on our exact biggest challenge, and we have a lot of challenges. 
but this is the biggest, which is I am naked in the sense of I have no platform and I have no app store optimization. Um, and that's scary, right? Because if you, even if you weren't making mobile, you relied on Steam significantly in their platform, right? And maybe you were on, and maybe we can look at something like Epic Game Store in the future to launch on. Because, but, but that's still a very, very, very small percentage of that audience, right? So we yeah. have a web game um, that is actually not a web game. The economics of it all happen on the web, but the game itself happens on a client. So you have a client download. Um, which is very very rare you know before nfts and before we were, we were sort of moved out from mobile due to as you say adam like just a lack of clarity is now i don't think it's even necessarily a um a desire not to do it steam no no i i, I think i think mobile will definitely be the way it moves forward it has to because that's that's where the the larger casual market is um, you know, the, the, the generally the casual players don't want to sit at a computer and, and, and play these games. Um, so it has to migrate that way. It's just waiting for the larger platforms to catch up with it all. Yeah, and we have to just run businesses and hope, in, in, like we are making or we will be producing a mobile version of Doctor Who because that audience is on phones, right? Absolutely. Um, we just have to work out when and how and, and, and see when we're going to get, because like uh, I, before you joined Adam, I was saying like we had Reality Clash, a mobile game with NFTs on the App Store in 2017 before Apple sort of said no. Um, before I really knew what an NFT was as far as their terms and services went, right? Mm. So we have been on there before, and you know, like, obviously we, we'd love to come back where we can have that sort of familiar um, place, right? The, the Some of the things that I've been seeing more recently, though, are, are the potential to use other stores, so the Huawei store or Samsung store and those type of things uh, that, that may be more inclined to agree with the... the the concept and also out of store. Um, I've certainly seen a lot more uh, distribution of APKs outside of the store, uh, running from a you know running from your own website, that kind of thing, um, to be able to to distribute um, and not not adhere to the 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 app store guidelines specifically. Um, I think the the in terms of the audiences at the moment they are. They are very different. Um, you know, the, the the mobile gaming audience and the the Web three gaming audience, because because a lot of it has turned into play to earn. It's it's uh, it is a different mindset. It's a it's not a, a traditional hardcore gamer mindset. In in I want to earn something or I'm going to take something away from this game. It's a it's a nice value add, but the game has to be appealing, you know, to 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 people who, are, who like like myself who've grown up with games who enjoy playing games on on PlayStation, on PC, on mobile. The game itself has to be enjoyable, and I, I think that's where some of what we see today isn't isn't there, you know, in terms of the actual gameplay, the actual enjoyment of what it is that you're playing. Um, but it is it is growing. Yeah, for so, sure. I mean, like the. Um... Yeah, but I will have some questions for you, but please. Okay. So, Adam, there's a question for you. Uh, why do you think conventional play to earn systems didn't thrive on a mobile? By con conventional, I mean those where you get direct USD, you get USD direct before playing and winning. Somebody is asking for you. Uh, it's so taking the cryptocurrency out of the equation, it, yeah. it, it converts too much to gambling. Um, and that's not supported on any of the app stores. So, I mean, that's, that's quite a, a simple answer for that one. Um, it's, it turned, it turns it into, uh, gambling, you know, you're playing the game in order to, to receive some monetary value in return, which, which is seen by the stores as gambling. And you told that um, audience are very different, NFT games and normal games. Yep. The mindset is different. Uh, yep. Is there any difference between the demographic information also? I mean, age, gender? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. I mean, like casual games, pretty much everyone is playing. Um, you know, you can pick up Candy Crush and you can play it on on uh, on your mobile, your dad's mobile, you know, whoever's. Um, I think with the with web3 games as it stands at the moment there's there's an entry point you know you need the pc for a start you need to understand how to create a wallet 
and the, those kind of um, entry barriers that there are at the moment. Um, it's not, you know, looking at looking at games like um, uh, NBA Hotshot, or I, I'm pretty sure the your, your Doctor Who one to, to reach to the example again. Um, they've they've minimized the friction within that entry point um, because it's all sort of viewed as part of the app. Um, but it, it's 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 still not as easy as picking up your mobile and just opening the app on you know on the screen. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, next question for you, Robert. Your Doctor Who project is very excited, and right now all brands are racing to enter the NFT world. How can gamification be integrated into NFT? Can you give an example? And with NFT. You know, digital artists began to reap the awards of their efforts for many years, actually. What should brands pay attention to in order not to be unattractive while entering this world? What is the correct way for a brand to enter an NFT world? Okay. <laughs> There's also a lot of questions, I guess. So, like, um, talking about the, the broader idea of, like, brands coming into the space, right? And we have... Doctor Who, which is this massive license, um, I, I'd say it's probably one of the biggest in Web3, um, especially because the, the BBC sort of came into this in a way that a lot of brands don't. They came in like full steam, right, with a game, which is a long term project. Um, it's not something that you can just test out, see how it goes. You have to really be committed to building over years um not necessarily you can build stuff faster but if you're trying to build quality and a game of an economy um like any nft game has to have as, as john mentioned um economies are difficult uh, they are one of the harder things that you can produce in in a, in a game and and get right uh, because it's hard to test an economy until it's out there so we have those sort of specializations in the business for what we did with, with the bbc now with other brands like it depends how uh, how their attitude is 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 with the whole project right like we get a lot of brands come in and they want to test the water which is the exact opposite of the bbc they want to do smaller stuff and like that can work for some brands but the answer to like how can brands enter it's so dependent on where that brand already sits within the market for nfts uh, and web3 in general right if there's already a, a big connection with a younger audience that makes a lot more sense if it's already a consumer brand that makes a lot more sense there's stuff that you can do with brands if you're talking about an older brand or a brand that's appealing more to like gen x uh, there are stuff that you can do where you're almost sort of saying to the brand let's reinvent this now for a modern audience and let's make this nft the next stage in the evolution of your brand and i think you'll see that a lot in fashion brands because they have uh, certain fashion brands can can quite easily move that stuff over. And there's a there's an easy move into fashion for the toe dipping, the, 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 the trying stuff out element, because fashion and art combine and NFTs and art have combined traditionally. Right. And the reason NFTs and art have done so well uh, and, 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 and art was really the genesis of the whole movement was because art was reasonably fast to produce versus games. Um, and I think games will take over in the next sort of three to five years as the core NFT push and the way that we use technology, uh, because there's a longer term sustainability and utility in, in, in incorporating that. But not every brand can make a game, right? So you have to work out how each brand can go in. And it's a bespoke thing. Every brand we talk to, it's a bespoke, like, this is where you are. This is where you could take NFTs and how it could work. Could you do a metaverse spin? Y yeah you could um should you well who knows right like it depends on the scale of your ip does it fit into a metaverse as a as a built area potentially do you want to integrate with sandbox or do you want to build your own experience is that even then a metaverse by the definitions of the web free hardcore no it probably wouldn't be right um does that matter well it depends on your audience again so there can be really complicated things to sort of set out for brands there are definitely a lot of ways that you can sort of see it done incorrectly um you can see i think a good example of this for me is pepsi doing an nft drop um 
I think the, the Pepsi NFT drop, which was these little microphones um, that were generative artwork, I think it probably would have been perfectly good had it launched uh, in the start, you know, like a, two years ago, back when everything was really picking off. Um, but it, it didn't. It launched. It launched in I think December this year, and you know, it just it was just everything that like you don't want to see from a from a brand entering the space. It was a single drop. It didn't really touch on like the history of the brand or anything authentic, and that is like the really key element of this driver Gen Z and, and millennial driver of authenticity into brands and connection with brands. That the Web three at its purest and best and most like utopian that that it connects to really well because you're actually taking what's previously been a shouting conversation out even web 2 even social media that was meant to be a two-way thing really became a scripted a scripted conversation between people and has has lost most of that authenticity uh, even now you web free can, can can fix that in a way it can bring those communities back into focus it can give communities more control over brand so to answer broadly very broadly what can brands do well they can they can make they can enter the space like with with their full intention of, of really being a part of it don't come in wanting to do something that's a drop uh, that's possible but think about it more like what's next what can we do next what's our strategy in three and five years time and come in with um some something that that that, that, that explains and answers the question why are you here because um, if it's just to make money, if the answer is just money, it, it's, it, it won't work with this audience. Um, you have to be here for a reason. And that, but in the same way that like you can join Twitter to make money in that sense. But there's much more that you can get from Twitter, from feedback, from community that you that you need to have in your plan or in your strategy when you start. Uh, it's much harder to add it in later. And I think those are the things that we communicate to brands of all sizes a lot of the time. Actually, it is like the beginning of the social media. Brands want to enter everywhere, but they don't think too much about uh, what is the reason. So there is one more question from audience. Uh, what was your pitch to get Doctor Who license? Is there any figures of your competitors that you shared? And do you have any competitors with NFT card games? Uh, our pitch was really to tell them what John and Adam have been speaking about. Um, it was to the BBC, for those that don't know, it's a very traditional organization that has um, it has a whole element of it, which is very unusual for an organization, which is it's funded by British taxpayers. So it has an obligation to sort of provide services. Um, and it's right on this cusp of being a very TV focused um, business into becoming a very digital business so we talked to them at the right time is the answer to, to that genuinely right we we had the right pitch at the right time for them to start looking into what's next for us as a business in a quicker than I, th I think as you rightly pointed out like everyone is looking now the BBC were just looking a little bit earlier because of this shift because of this perceptional shift and this organizational shift so we came and we sort of were our pitch was that we are a safe pair of hands ultimately our pitch was we're not doing play to earn our, our, our pitch was I mean and we are we are doing play to earn because any game that has an NFT in it as part of a ranking system that you didn't pay for that you can sell is a play to earn game but we the message in there would not be play to earn for us because it wouldn't work for that audience um so that was part of it like okay we're going to do nft but we are going to always have a very clear purpose for that nft um and the bbc really liked that and then, then we we didn't really look at the competition in blockchain because um the competition to us is in uh, other card games and other licensed experiences um, because we're trying to make a really good game because this audience needs to see it. And as Adam was saying, right, we can't put a wallet in front of this audience and make it work. We have a crypto dedicated fan base where the messaging is very different, but you can't ask these people to connect a MetaMask. You can't ask my mum to connect a MetaMask, right? So our wallet is sort of like a back end thing um, and it's, it, it's produced like as you log into the game and then you can export cards if you wish if you want to get into the back end of it that's another thing that appealed to the bbc right accessibility all the way through um 
with, with and not just connecting just to that web free audience you can then argue that we're not a real web free experience some of the definition of web free would be uh that you have to log in with a wallet for it to be web free um but to us it's it's less about hits ticking all the ch check boxes of, of what a web free thing is and it's more about helping this brand and this audience start to move into the space okay thank you very much no so eugene your background is very cool i think it's from deep mind world and as deep mind world do you think nft gamification will be satisfied or will it appear in many different forms what activities will be planned for gamers who want a never-ending adventure in metaverse what are your plans well, I, I mean, to answer this question, I think, you know, the guys have touched so many bases for me, especially when they told about like the community being the pinnacle of an NFT game and the economy being the pinnacle of an NFT game. And the funny thing is that we call ourselves the first social economic strategy, because the thing is that we don't have PVP in our game. Uh, we have a collective effort. So all the gamers, they work together towards the common goal. So the community for us is everything because if you because if you're playing alone, you can you can do anything. I mean, like you need to you need to play with the community. And the other thing is because we have an economic strategy for us, getting economy right is just vital because everything like everything in the game is surrounded, uh, you know, uh, surrounding the the open market economy we are building. And the other thing is, uh, I think, you know, you need to realize that play to earn, even though it's been like a term for a couple of years, it's been around for, for decades, actually, because uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like shilling here, but in a couple of hours, it's, uh, I, I will be having a solo speech about play and earn and how it evolved to the place we have now. And you need to realize that, I mean, like you can say that it started in like, for example, in World of Warcraft. Because people, there were people that were playing professionally to to gain like resources and assets and then sell them, and th and that's essentially play to earn. So there is nothing new in this concept except from the blockchain side that gives you the the ability to trade those assets without you know going to some shady websites. So uh, I think you know there's definitely a market because it's been around for so many years. But but the thing is, what we need to do, and I think what will happen very soon, is when the conventional uh, gaming platform. I think Adam said you know that like the studio, the studios that do mobile gaming, they're kind of separate from from from, from blockchain game gaming now. But what will happen is that those bigger bigger studios that know how to make really cool fun games that you know that can engage millions and when they when they can like build a business model that that will because that's the problem like bigger studios they're afraid of losing control uh, over their games they, they want to have all the control over their product and they're afraid okay if we integrate blockchain everything is out there we can't control blockchain you know it, once once the asset is on the blockchain we can take it we can we can do anything with it and i think that once those bigger guys they uh, integrate they integrate those uh, like integrate blockchain and nft gaming into their into their products uh, the market will be just booming and, and it's not like it's not a matter if it will happen it will happen it, it definitely will because there is there is just no other way for them to go because uh and again like the uh when you look at the world world of warcraft like counter strike global offensive those were huge huge shady markets you know shadow shadow economy was just billions of dollars of, of in skins in assets and the thing is but the problem was there was like money laundering you know through that because it was all like not controlled it was not uh uh you, you couldn't trace it and, and stuff like that now with a blockchain it just solves it so i think what will happen with the market is that like triple triple a uh, games will enter they will just integrate the best of the of the blockchain and 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 because now we're talking like a couple of million people playing play to earn and most of them playing for the earn part because and that's the problem and i think once we have people come and play for the fun of it and then just getting something uh as a, as a side a side effect i think we'll, the market will be booming thank you uh one question from audience are blockchain games closer to gambling or betting by their essence actually you yeah. answer 
can I follow? I mean, like, I, I think I think I kind of answered that, you know, with with given an example of World of Warcraft. I mean, like, no one said that playing World of Warcraft was gambling, right? But again, if you played a lot and if you like uh, got a, some rare sword there, you could sell it for tens of thousands of dollars. And I don't think that anyone called it gambling. So I, I, I don't think that it's either close close to gambling. Or <coughs> I, I, I don't I think, think it's a... It's a <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think, I think yeah, John. Uh, yeah, I, to, I mean, it's, it's a question that does come up a lot, and and clearly, you know, because mo, you know, game games have never really had this, um, you know, in a formal sort of way that something you do in the game can be um, then sort of cashed out for real money. I mean, we've had a some some sort of platforms that have done it where you do something in a game and you earn something you can cash out as a Amazon token or something like that. Is some of that sort of stuff, but um. <clears throat> Without being a lawyer, I mean, the, the, every country has sort of slightly different views on 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 gambling, and we have actually seen in the non blockchain space, you know, uh, certainly in Europe, places like uh, or, I mean, Belgium is the obvious one, but Belgium and, and the Netherlands have sort of said that sort of loot boxes are gambling um, in in free to play mobile games and, and PC games. So you often find now, I mean, they just announced Blizzard just announced yesterday that Diablo Immortal won't be released in in Belgium or the Netherlands because as they have set up their gambling laws that those games with loot boxes will would be seen as gambling and they would get fined so so it's not just blockchain this is sort of something in general that that sort of as games have sort of a more sophisticated monetization methods you know sort of the some legislations some governments have changed their legislation around what they think gambling is and certainly in the UK there are sort of MPs who 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 sort of think loot boxes should be seen as gambling um Generally, what you find though is the definition of of gambling is there's no skill involved. So as soon as any, as soon as you have, if you have a game where literally you, you sort of randomly get something for sort of turning up and then you can sell that that on, um, then that would definitely be seen as, as as gambling. So I think probably some games at the moment, blockchain games, would be seen generally as gambling. But if you have there's some sort of skill based thing involved, um, then that's normally the sort of the dividing line that you know I I may be able to sort of risk something, but if you have to be good at it. Um, so you find there's, there's a platform called Skills, actually pretty big in the States, where basically you can plug in their SDK and any mobile game. You can do a head to head sort of wager. So I can go, let's play Angry Birds. I'll pay. I'll play. You know, I'll, I'll send a request to Robert. Robert, let's play Angry Birds. The person who get we we'll both put five dollars in. The person who wins gets nine dollars. The, the platform gets one dollar. Um, and who, it's whoever gets the highest score there. And that wouldn't be seen as gambling in most places because. Yeah, you know, I'm not just pressing a button and I get a random get a score. But I have to actually have to be sort of good good at the game to do it. So, so um, I definitely think there will be more pressure around that sort of stuff. And I think going back to the, the early days of free to play mobile, I don't know if people remember. I, I certainly do. But you know, when sort of um, uh, the first sort of microtransactions came in, and you had all these headlines about you know um, there, was, there was a game called Smurf Smurf Village, I think it was called, and there was all these headlines around Smurf Village and s s these poor families had given their children their iPhones with a credit card in it and the kids have spent three thousand dollars buying Smurf berries and there was all this sort of stuff going on and and um you know uh, and then you know Apple had to change their terms and set you know teach people how to do passwords and I think there'll be a bit of that um just because you know blockchain just uh, just has so much more velocity of, of sort of um sort of value in it uh, but equally there will be these I, th I think you know clearly over time there will be and I guess we get it get this a bit in the general nft kind of sphere now where people are I think are amazed or horrified that a picture of an ape might cost a million dollars. They just, well, what's that? So, so I've just, you know, I've just, uh, I've just uh, copied and paid, you know, I've just sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, copied it. Um, is it worth a million dollars? So, so there are sort of, I think there is that sort of education bit around it, uh, but equally there will be people and probably games will, will highlight this where there'll be someone will turn up to a free to play game. They'll start playing it. They'll happen to be really good at the game and they'll end up with something worth $10,000 or a million dollars. And then they go, I sold this thing in the game and I bought a house. You know, that you, now I guess whether we think that's a good thing or not is is, is a bit more of a sort of personal preference on on our views on whether games are serious or not. But um, but but clearly, just away from sort of blockchain and gaming, you know, so much of our of live for many people is moving more online. That I think you know fundamentally for me, a blockchain is just a way of, you know, in in a trustless decentralized way basically working out how the value of those ecosystems plays out. And as everyone's pointed out, that's very different to Web Web 2, where we all put our information in and Facebook made a ton of money. So, you know, <laughs> anything that improves that situation, I, I, th I think is going to be good. And and law laws are going to have to sort of, you know, um, be modified around that, uh, I think. I think Adam also wants to add something. 
I, I, I completely agree with John. It's, <laughs> okay. but, but one thing that I would like to add is, is blockchain and blockchain gaming is the, the sort of foundation, the platform of what, what is being built. So by its very nature, a blockchain game isn't gambling. It's the, the, the type of game that you build on top of the blockchain um, and the mechanics of how you monetize and everything else, you know, like, like, like John was talking about with loot boxes and that kind of thing. That's a game mechanic which can be seen as gambling and is seen as gambling by some countries. But it, it's, it's the, the monetization methods that the games use can be perceived as gambling, not the underlying technology itself. And Robert, do you want to add something else? Um, because I, th I think I think every, everyone is <laughs> is exactly on point with this. Like I, I feel like potentially the reason why it gets highlighted so much in this space is because I think you've had a lot of projects that have sort of confused play to earn, which is a feature as a whole genre, as a game within themselves, right? And when you when you look at some of these, and you, yeah, you take it to Warcraft or you take it to loot boxes. The, the 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 reason why there's been I mean, there's plenty of negativity around loot boxes, but I think the reason why there's been so much around play to earn is because there's been so many projects that have just been that's what you do. When you say play to earn, the, the very like phrase of it, right? It 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 turns off a lot of people. Uh, and yeah, like we, that's why we avoid it. Like even though we will have them, and like yeah, it's going to get very complicated from a regulatory perspective because we will have an NFT that will give away to you as a level up, right? As a rank, you might get a card, and that card will be tradable. If we make that card tradable, are we? Has that been a skill? It, have have you had to go through a skill based thing to do that? Arguably not, because you could rank up and still be terrible. You just rank up slower, right? So that's going to start to get complicated as you get into like the more in depth games and the more in depth mechanics. But that's part of sort of growing as an industry, I think, and having uh, um, the laws sort of update and and get more clarity as we go. Okay, we have the last few minutes and I want to ask John and then all of you guys, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who wants to enter NFT games for market? <laughs> mm, that's quite a In few question. sentence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, so, so the one thing, you know, I say I've sort of been in this space for like four and a half years now. So to some degree, I, I think I have some level of expertise, but, but equally the, the thing that I think keeps me interested in this is, you know, everything can change very, very quickly. So I, I think um, you, have to, you do have to spend a lot of time. If you know nothing at all about this, then, then it is quite a, um, you know, quite a learning curve. And, you, and the only way really you can do it is, is you have to spend time. Uh, you, have to spend, you have to spend time playing some of these games. I mean, choose one you like and, and just sort, sort of, you have to spend some money getting involved and seeing what happens. You have to spend time, particularly in, in sort of discord groups and, and channels and, yeah, I spend a lot of time on Twitter looking at what's going on. And and, and I think um, if you're sort of the other thing is, I, I think if you're particularly if you're a game sort of maker and you want to think about how can how can this new technology be brought to games? Um, my sort of view is there's a lot of, you know, sort of, sort of cookie cuttering stuff going on. So Axie Infinity is a success. And then suddenly there's everything is Axie Infinity, but with chickens or, or llamas or something, you know, something. Um, and, and clearly you know, <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, so I think if, if people have had a bit of experience of making games, I think they need to think about what, you know, what sort of games they like to make and what sort of games if they have a studio that studio is sort of good at. I don't think if you've been making match-free games, you should be going and making a MMORPG on the blockchain, you know. Um, some existing skills from Web 2 are going to be really valuable in Web 3. But I think you have to think about, there's a lot of activity out there. There's a lot of people raising money. There's a lot of sort of teams doing stuff. So what are you going to do? What's going to you? What's going to give you an edge? You know, in your experience, for the things you like, the things you've done in the past, and then think, you know, quite deeply about, you know, why you're using the blockchain. Because if you're sort of making a game that you want to make, and you're sort of just adding blockchain in because that's how you get funding, or that's um, that, that's the that's the sort of cool thing to do at the moment, then it's probably not going to work out for you. I, I think you need to, um, you know, think quite deeply about. Because I think some games can be really heavy blockchain projects. They can be, you know, a bit like Axie Infinity, you know, two two tokens and governance is going to come and DAOs and NFTs and staking and DEXs and your own blockchain and blah, 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 blah. You, know, you can really go down that. And, and for some teams, that's brilliant. But for other teams, it literally may be you, you're making a, a game and you just give people 
who rank on the leaderboard in NFT. You know, you don't have any tokens. It's just very lightweight and you sort of build a community and over time you sort of see how that goes. There's no there's no right or wrong way of doing it. I think it really depends on the project and and, and their experience. Okay. Eugene, do you want to add something? Do you have any advice? Wow. Well, I mean, like, I think the guys covered everything. I just, you know, <laughs> don't want to talk again everything they said. Okay. Robert, do you have any last words? As far as advice goes, I will join Eugene in the shilling because I have a talk about this whole thing. Um, it's it's a talk about the whole, like, what we've learned moving into Web3 from, from being a traditional gaming audience. Like, I think the biggest piece of advice is, is, is touching on what John said really, like, everything that was important about making a game without NFTs and blockchain elements is still equally as important as it is when you want to add them in uh, and keep keep your eyes on the prize with it right like that when you're developing a longer term game like um like, like we are in this chat right you have to you sit by why things like axie go up and they go down and like there is this desire especially there's pressure from investment and from um the market to sort of react 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 and um, but what you get with that is a very short term um, product that, that that effectively isn't going to work in the in the long term and you need your game especially your online game with an economy to be functioning for for many years to come so and adam uh, I, do you have any last words very quickly i'd say go for it but make sure you innovate with it like like the others are saying it's got to be something that people actually want to play more than it being a crypto game like it, it, the game is the most important part yeah, can I can I chip in? I mean, a, a, my presentation that will be up in three hours ends with the three words: make it fun. I think that's that's it. Perfect. <laughs> okay, there are lots of questions, but our time is up, so I think they can ask you via direct message or something like that. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I enjoyed and learned a lot. I hope everyone enjoyed, and thank you for thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.